Let's go to James 5. Look at verse 17 and 18. It's kind of interesting how James approached this subject. Uh, out of his Bible, the Septuagint. <laughs> at the end of ver uh, 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 at the end of verse sixteen, so we'll need the end of verse sixteen to get this. James says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much from the New American Standard. That's his thesis of the subject of prayer. Then he, he uses Elijah as an illustration of the principle, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. He says, Elijah was a man with a ma nature like ours. I'll, I'll talk about that tonight a little bit. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It did not rain on the earth for three and a half years or three months, uh, three years, six months. He prayed again and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. Now, we always look for markers. It's pretty obvious what the marker is here, isn't it? Prayer. I think he used it five times, uh, if I remember counting it. Uh, four or five times. 16, he used it once. 17, two, three, I guess three times. Three times. But anyhow, it, it becomes the key uh, for us to look at. The, the One of the things that you don't see is there are different words for prayer that were used in this text. I, I mentioned them to you on your paper. You can't see them in the, in the, in the Greek language. In the English, they're going to translate them a different way for... Uh, for example, uh, he uses the word um, in the greater context, in the greater context, which goes way back to verse 13 in chapter 5. At the top of your paper, I mentioned that he used it eight times. He used the word prayer eight times in the greater context of verses 13 through 18. 18. But uh, what is interesting is that he uses the word prayer um, prosukamai is the typical word in the English for prayer. If if they say prayer or pray, it typically means th that what we would say pray. Would you open with prayer? But like in verse, and so that word is used throughout thirteen through eighteen. It's used. It, it's used a great deal. But this word prosukamai is used when it says um, the effective prayer of a righteous man. The effective prayer of a righteous man. In verse 15, a little prior to that, in the, in the greater context, the word in English is described as prayer. Uh, it's under, in my text, it's underlined better, but this is UK. Notice Notice E-U-C-H-E, -E, see that on your paper? Now look up the word prior to it. Without P-R-O-S, which is a preposition, notice that it, the preposition pros is put on the front of the same word. See, E-U-C-H-O, that's a verb. Do you see that? It's the same word. Uh, and, uh, and it is used for the prayer of faith. It, it, when that word is used, it might say prayer, but it's it's talking about you you. If that word in the Greek is used, then you have to look to context. You look to context. Look look at verse fifteen. The prayer offered in faith. If it's if it's if if it's UK, then you're always looking to what what part of prayer 
is being emphasized. Do you understand that? If it's pros eukamai, then it's just talking about prayer in general. And so, and, and so in our text, uh, or in verse 16, when it says the effective prayer of a righteous man avails much, it's the word desis. Uh, and, and, and it's actually the word um, that, again, when it's given there, it's sometimes, it's the idea of petition. But here the emphasis of this prayer is the effectiveness of a righteous man who prays. The word, the word effective, and then the word prayer is not, is neither one of the two previous words. It's desis, D-E-S-I-S is the word for prayer. And, uh, and the emphasis of this word is, is um, the, uh, uh, how prayer is, how it works more, uh, the mechanics of it, the mechanics of it. And so it's talking about the effective prayer, the effective peti uh, petition of a righteous man accomplishes much. So the emphasis is that if you want an effective prayer life, you've got to learn how to be a righteous person. You've got to live in a, ri a righteous way. Uh, so... I just show you that. This makes it kind of interesting because you can't see it in the English. You can't see any of that in the English. And so it's, it's helpful to know some of that. Thus prayer, when you look at the greater context of 13 through 18, uh, prayer in some form is used eight times. Now what is interesting to me is that James picked Elijah as a man of prayer to make a doctrinal point. I mean, he's been talking about prayer, 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 prayer. And now he picks a guy to illustrate what he's been talking about, about prayer since verse 13. 13 through 18. Now he picks a guy. He has a lot of guys to pick from out of the Old Testament, his Bible. And he picks Elijah. Now, Elijah was a man of prayer. And they have that similar with James. James is known in biblical history as a man of prayer. In fact, we don't know how true all this is, but historically, uh, he, people said that James had camel, uh, camel needs. Camel knees. You know how, they, you know how odd they are at the knee? Because he was on his knees so much in prayer. So that, that's just kind of interesting. But he picks a guy that was known as a man of prayer. And then what's interesting to me is he picks one story out of his life. He picks one. Now, there are a lot of stories out of the life of Elijah about his prayer life. But he picks, he picks Elijah to make a point about the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And he picks Elijah who is known uh, as a man of prayer. And James is known as a man of prayer. And here's another co co coincidence in the plan of God, right? We don't believe in them, do we? Coincidences. Now, they're all by divine design. But here's what's interesting, that James, this apparently was one of James' favorite guys. And one of the reasons is that they were both ministering to a nation, the priest nation of Israel, under discipline, under discipline. Uh, when Elijah, he quotes, when he quotes this story about Elijah, and this is a famous story about he prays that it will not rain, and God holds it up for three and a half years and puts it under famine drought, and then he prays again and the rain comes back. Well, the nation of Israel, when he makes this prayer, the reason he makes this prayer, which I'm going to talk about tonight, is because the nation is about to go under the second cycle. James is with the same priest nation, so to speak, the same priest nation of Israel, and they're about to go. They're in, they're about to go in the fourth and the fifth. Um, James may not live to see it, but because James is pastoring them forty-five, and we're not quite sure, but, but we know he didn't make that. Length, but because he's going to be one of the early ones to die, but 
uh, but his people are going under the fifth in, in, in 70 AD, and he's, he's, he's telling them in 45, we're in trouble. And let me tell you, you've got to correct it because the trouble is you. <laughs> and so these guys had, and Elijah told them the same thing, and we'll talk about that tonight. But I just find it kind of interesting when guys pick up and they go in there, their uh their what their motive and reasoning and all that and this was one of his favorite guys that he liked to preach on apparently and so he does that now elijah the man of prayer yet to really get this you have to look at his life for example in first king 17 1 and we'll go to it in a moment and the eighth chapter 18th chapter one and two and then read some other parts to it to get this story together. In other words, in the Old Testament, if you're going to read about something like this guy, he mentions it in a couple verses. <laughs> it takes up two chapters. So well, I'm not going to do all that. But um, when you go to the Old Testament for information, it, it takes a lot of reading and a lot of effort. But I'm going to talk about five things about why he picked Elijah, the man of prayer, and what they had in common and what the problem was and why prayer is important. And how important, you know, we sit around, we talk about our nation is going to this and is happening to that. You know, the answer to it is prayer. They, 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 all the New Testament writers tell you, pray for your nation. And then, uh, and then be evangelical. You know, pray for your nation, then be evangelical within it. You know, the only way pe people's hearts are changed is through conversion. Uh, so the proper way of changing so he picks, he picks Elijah, and I made my title that way. Uh, Eli, the name Elijah means uh, the, Lord, the, the Lord is my God. That's be very important in my lesson on Sunday. The Lord is my God. I wonder how many people really believe that, that the Lord is my God. Every Christian should believe that. But I don't know how many people do. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into our study on this, having introduced it. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. For those who are visiting with us on the Internet, we encourage you to do the same thing as we're about to explain the Bible's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type of sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins. You're to make confession because you're carnal, carnal. You've got to get back to spirituality, especially in Bible study and in your Christian life in order to have the Holy Spirit minister uh, teach you in recall. John 14, 26, for example. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I give you a moment to do that. Confess or name your sin, whatever it is. And the blood of Christ that worked, worked for your salvation will now work for your spirituality. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth about Elijah, the man of prayer, and how important prayer is in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll look at five things tonight. First, like James, Elijah was preaching to an apostate priest nation of Israel under the five cycles of divine discipline. You can read about these five cycles. People often um, write me and say, uh, Rod, I was listening to you, and you keep talking about five cycles of divine discipline. Where would I find them in the Bible? Well, you'll find them in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 is where you'll find them. And they're very, they're very evident. Once you find them, you can always go back and go, oh, yeah, I see the five. Um, so that's where I find them. This apostasy of Israel, both in the time of Elijah and James, went from top to bottom in the nation. Now, we're talking about the North Kingdom with, with Elijah. We're talking about the North Kingdom of ten tribes. And we're talking about a period of time of King Ahab, you know, Ahab and Jezebel. And they were engaged to their eyeballs, as they might say, 
in Baal religion of failed cult. And when I say top to bottom, I mean all the way from Ahab the king all the way down to the citizenry. They were involved deeply in Baal worship of the failed cult. You can read about this, Ahab, in 1 Kings 16.30. I put it on your paper. And it says he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And here's what that means for people like us, I suppose, or guys like me. This is like in your face. In your face. You ever heard that expression? In your face. In your face. And when it says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord, that means in his face. And listen to this phrase, more than all. Listen, there were a lot of corrupt kings in the North Kingdom. That's why he brought all this discipline on him. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Didn't matter what the Lord told him through the prophets, he went right ahead and did it anyhow, in your face. And uh, so it's uh, time for the face to respond. As a prophet to Israel and to the king Ahab, Elijah was sent by God with a message for Ahab that starts our lesson in 1 Kings 17, 1. So let's just pop over there for a moment, if you can find Kings. First Kings, I found the second. I got Chronicles. Now I'm close. 17.1. Here's where this thing, this is how, this how, this is where James has picked up his storyline. He's going to run this whole deal. Uh, now it came about after these things, the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, now it says Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the sellers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew or rain these years except by my word. That's going to wind up three and a half years of drought. The Lord has told him, he's given the Lord's word, which is now his word, the Lord has spoke to me, and now I speak to you. Here are my words from the Lord. Okay? Now remember this phrase, neither do or rain. That's really important. And then we have the story of Elijah's life going on. Let's go to the 18th chapter, verse 1. We're going to look at 1 and 2, I think. 1 and 2. Now, as it came about after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the, land, in the third year, I'm in 1 Kings 18, 1, saying, go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Which Now, this three and a half years is to tell them that you're going to go into the second, you're going to go into the second cycle of discipline if you do not correct your idolatry, okay? So God puts them under discipline of the second cycle, and they come out of it, okay? They come out. Rain means that they came out of it. And so there was some movement about it, okay? So Elijah went and showed himself to Ahab. The famine was really severe in Samaria. Now, if you drop down a little bit in that notice up there, 17 through 20, just to give you a little highlights of where he's going. It came about when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, is this you the trouble, the troublemaker of Israel? And he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you have followed the Baals, that's the Phalic cult. Now, then he talked about the 450 prophets of Baal that were running the country's religion system, okay? The, then 
if you'll go down to verse 41, which is really interesting story, where he says, Elijah says to Ahab, go up and eat and drink, for there is a sound of the roar of a heavy shower. And then a a Ahab does it, and the rain comes. Okay? This, all of these chapters that we're, which I just spun through real quick, is the background to two verses. The effect of prayer of a righteous man, and I want to talk about Elijah, he says. Okay? Elijah. Okay? And this is the background. And I'm going to show you that background. It's really important you understand that background. They are heavily engaged in idolatry of the worst sort. The, I mean, I don't know that one sin is bigger than the other or one find of evil is bigger than the evil. But the failing cult was, it always got Israel. <laughs> always got them. And I suppose it still gets the church too. Point number two. Elijah's prayer targeted the lifeblood, and this is really important. It targeted the lifeblood of the priest nation's economy and livelihood, agriculture. That's why the second cycle of discipline is going to hit them hard. It, it's going to, you know, they're going to get hit hard in their pocketbook. You know, their pocketbook. Because of Elijah's prayer, God shut down the entire economy of Israel for three, I mean stopped it dead for three and a half years by a severe life and death famine, much like the one we're studying on Tuesday night in the life of Joseph for a different reason. One of the famous stories that comes out of this drought is the widow of Zarephath, which Jesus talked about to Israel have going through the same stuff in Luke 4, 25, 26. This is that time period and what's going on. You can read about the actual story in 1 Kings 18, or 17 verses 8 through 16. That's not my point tonight, and I'm going to pass on it, but it is part of this storyline. James describes this prayer of Elijah that shut down the entire economical life of Israel for three and a half years. You think he was a popular guy? ha. <laughs> I mean, he was so unpopular and so hated, he had to go, uh, he had to always go, I mean, he lived most of the time in a cave and stuff. I mean, he couldn't get out into public because he was so hated because everybody knew he had prayed this prayer. Instead of going like, wow, well, if he's got that kind of prayer, let's find out what we need to do to get our economy back. None of them thought that way. And so James says, the effective. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the Greek word, and this is important. It's where you get the word energy. It's spelled E-N-E-R-G-E-S. It's where the English word energy comes from. And this word is used, effectual, the effectual prayer, or the effective prayer. And it means a, a powerful thing in action. Something powerful in action. Effective means something powerful in action. Context tells you what, and this idea is prayer. The prayer of a righteous man. Now this word, this same word, let me show you how, how, what a unique word this is in the Greek language. The same word for effective is used in 1 Corinthians 16, 9 for mission field work. God has opened a wide door for effective service. And he's talking about preaching the gospel. And he says, and there are many adversaries against it. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Here's another place. I, I just picked a couple places I thought would be interesting to us. The other is Hebrews 4, 12. This word is used in Hebrews 4, 12. 
The word of God is alive, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. This is the word when it says living, active, or operative, and sharper. Living, powerful, sharper. The word of God. I for, anyway, Pam, look up uh, Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is alive, powerful. I, I learned it that way. But I don't know, how, how is it in that New American Standard? Because I memorized it out of the King James. See, powerful is a good, is a good definition of that word. But uh, just for the word of God is living and active. Active. See, both words are correct from the Greek language. One is talking about the action. The other is talking about the power. But they're both. But that's the word. The word of God is alive. Active or powerful means powerful in action and sharper than a two-edged sword. And, of course, a military illustration. Now, let me ask you a question. Because this great New Testament translates in our as efficient. Efficient. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I don't like that. I don't like it, but that's okay, I suppose. Um, powerful. Mm -hmm. Powerful. What I want to... Here, here's, here's, here's a simple doctrinal principle that is lost today in America. Who is in control of Earth's environment? Now, when I was a kid growing up, everybody knew the answer to that. Today, nobody knows it. Well, I mean, we do, but... But, I mean... We're hard from we're far from the Norman standard in in the United States, and we're far from Norman standard in the Church of the United States. Who's in control of time? This lesson will answer that because Elijah answers it, doesn't he? He tells you who's in control of the earth, environment of the earth. Uh, we've we listen. Of course, you're going to think it's a, 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 a other things once you throw God out. <laughs> I mean, take God out, then you can argue stupidity. Three, the sovereignty of God. Now, I want to show you something really ma magnificent while you come to Bible study. The sovereignty of God stopped the creative order of the third day of creation. I want you to go to this. Genesis, you can find easy. Yeah, right? Genesis 1. I want you to, sometimes we just forget this creative order of days. We forget it. We think it's long ago, and it probably doesn't affect us anymore. That creative order still was still going on. And so uh, you're looking at the third day in verses uh, one, uh, 11 through 13. I was trying to say, the second day closes in verse 8. And let the waters above, and that God drives the land, and God says, let the earth sprout. Look at verse 11. The, the, the whole thing, as soon as the second day's over, we're in the third day, which actually, actually goes from 9 to 13. I just wanted to pick up what the third day is doing, that, listen, God stopped. Watch this. Let the earth sprout vegetation, plant yielding seeds, fruit trees bearing fruit after their kind with seeds in them on the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plant yielding seeds after their kind. The, you know, that's men. That's species. And trees bearing fruit with seeds in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. Third day, verse 13. Agreed? My point, in, my point to you is this. When James says this, when he uses this, Elijah in 16, 17 and 18, off from the effectual firm prayer, this is what he's talking about. God set, stopped that entire system from working for three and a half years. Shut it down. And, this, and the, when you study, in a moment we will, when you study 
the second cycle of divine discipline, you see how he does it. And what the result is, when he shuts that down, and listen, he shut it down, and I think this is amazing to me. Earth's a pretty big place. He shut that down in one geographical location <laughs> only. Think about that. You know, this is like you hook up your sprinkler in the backyard. It's not doing anything for the front yard, but it's doing something for the backyard. He shut this. The planet Earth's a big deal. It's a pretty big place. He shut the third day down in one location like a sprinkler system. He just went out there and shut that one part off. That's a, listen, if, if, if you're not impressed with the sovereignty of God, something's wrong here. He did it with Joseph too, didn't he? Did the same thing with Joseph. This is what James is talking about. God did it again during Joseph over, over, over that seven-year period. He put him in life and death situation. Elijah did it in three and a half years. He put him in life and death. Of course, after the second year, even Joseph's people were in life to death situation. After the second year, remember. Uh we, we recently talked about that in Genesis 47, 13. Look at the importance. I want to show you something now. In the Genesis, you didn't, you're still in Genesis, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Go with me to the second chapter. I'll show you how, how, all the, how important the third day of creation is to the operation of our livelihood, agriculture. Second chapter, I wrote, by the way, I wrote it on your, I wrote, that's on your paper, Genesis 2, 5 and 6. Listen, now no shrubs of the field was yet in the earth. No plant of the field had yet sprouted. F watch this now. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground, but a mist or dew was used to, ri used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Listen to me now. I can't tell you how important this is about God's sovereignty. When Elijah prayed that prayer, God shut down the third, the third day creative order in a specific geographical area. Listen. It is supposed to produce that. And he shut down the dew and the rain. You understand? None of it. That's what he prayed, that it would not rain and there would be no dew. Listen, what, he, what Genesis 2, 5, and 6 is talking about is the third day of creation. Right? We just read that. <laughs> we read it out of Genesis 1, people. He's talking again about it in Genesis 2, 5, and 6. Genesis 5 and 6. James picked Elijah for all of these theological reasons, in my opinion. And he's described by James in the most interesting way. James says that he was a man with a nature like ours. <clears throat> I suppose you, like me, are curious about the word nature because there are different Greek words for it. This is the word homopathic in the English dictionary. It means that his nature was a man passionate about life like all of us. Like the simple things of life as well as every once in a while you know, something unique and different and special that made me feel that way. And if you study the life of Elijah, you'll find that he was kind of that guy. He was an emotional guy. He was passionate. He was compassionate. You know, that's the other side of it, passion and compassion. 
And so he, he says, you know, if you're thinking that Elijah wasn't a guy like us, you know, we say that he put his pants on the same way we do. I don't know if that's true, but I suppose it is one leg at a time. I suppose that's what that means. But that's what he's got in mind to us. He wasn't this super guy. He was a righteous guy that made his own. He made mistakes in life, but he was a man who believed in God. He was a man who trusted God. He was a man who studied God and wanted to be that man of God for him. And Elijah was a guy like most of us. A guy like most of us. Not, not a superhero. Didn't go around with a cape on and identity like that. You know, he was just a Clark Kent guy. Every once in a while call, called upon to do something uh, super, just like the rest of us. Do I? He what? He had a <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> and he had a fire chariot. <laughs> I guess he was a little more super than I thought. Yeah, thank you. Maybe the only difference between Elijah and us is he learned how to pray and hit the target every time. The, the effective prayer of a righteous man can came. He, he really believed that. But he was just a guy like you and I. He was noth nothing. Except when God taught him something, he believed it and he carried it to the end. I like that about him. You know, like 1 John 5, 14 and 15. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If he hears us, he, we get it. And, and th that's true for all of us, no matter how you put your pants on. Point number four. Elijah's prayer was directed against the, nation, the national economy to awaken the people from the top to the bottom, spiritually to their apostasy and evil, and to get them to turn their hearts back to the Lord. When Jonah was sent into Nineveh, he didn't want to go because he knew he would have to be faithful to preach the message, and the message was to turn the hearts of the people back to the Lord. Jonah 8.3. Isn't, listen. Isn't God wonderful? I mean, he's a, the sovereignty of God. Just think that every time you pray a prayer according to the will of God, the sovereignty of God is called into action. The sovereignty of God. Oh, my goodness. In 1 Kings 17, we're introduced to this problem of pale, idolatry of Baal worship. In 2, and this is easy to remember, in 2 Kings 17, the nation, the North Kingdom, will go under the fifth cycle. It will be 722 B.C. Let me show you God's faithfulness and his grace. Ahab was king about 864 or something. There's about a 150-year gap when they were warned by Elijah until they hit the fifth. God put them under the second. They responded. They had another 150 years before God took them out. They just couldn't leave idolatry alone. Generation after generation. You say, well, you would think that one generation would learn life from the other generation like they did in the wilderness. Let me show you the difference. That would be true if there, but there always has to be somebody to tell the children. The, the thing that got the North Kingdom is the parents pushed really hard for their kids to engage in Baal worship. They pushed hard. Listen, Baal sometimes would ask for one of your children to be burned by fire as an offering. And they would do it. It shows you how strong the phallic idea is in the human race. What he... 
what he's preaching is to awaken the north kingdom to avoid the second which Elijah has prayed for to get and it lasted three and a half years before they responded and God said call off call off the dogs unless I'm ready to send rain and they awoke for a while and then what slumped right back into their old habits right that's a problem with most of us we just you know he lets us out of the hospital and we say well I'll not do that again and then we slump back into our old ways it just was difficult for these people now I want you to I want you to go with me to Deuteronomy Exodus Leviticus numbers Deuteronomy I want to show you the second cycle of five and we're going to find them in verses 22 through 24 You, when you're following the cycles, you always watch till the, they're going to say, like in, the, in Genesis, they say day one, day two, day three. This one they're going to say, and seven times more. You go, you go to the next one. But here we are, um, 20, I'm looking at 22 through 24. I'm just hitting the part of it. The Lord will smite you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, this is all part of the second, and with fiery heat, you see, they're coming off the first, which is, is f illnesses and diseases. A fiery heat with a sorry, and with blight, with mildew, and they will pursue, you with, will pursue you until you perish. Now watch, verse 23. The heavens which is over your head shall be bronze, and the earth is under you will become iron. The Lord will make the rain of your land powder and dust from heaven. It shall come down on you until you are destroyed. Now, there is not going to be any dew and there's not going to be any rain. The heavens is going to be bronze and the earth is going to be iron. Now, boy, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to plant your garden <laughs> in iron and hope to get a crop. The same thing you can read about the second cycle in Leviticus 28 or 26, 18 through 20. In other words, the atmosphere of the earth is going to, but listen, listen to me, in one geographical location. Now who can do that? God. What a mar marvelous thing. And why is he going to do it? Because they're eat up with cosmos diabolicas. They've gone to worship false gods. And the worst of them was Baal. The very worst of them were Baals. And Israel is going to stay away from it. Elijah wanted them to learn that the national crisis was not the famine. They all said the famine. They blamed God and blamed Elijah. The problem was, it was the evil of idolatry. Elijah warned them to learn that the national crisis was not the famine. It was the apostasy and the evil. Listen, we're up to our eyeballs in it today in America. They think, they think a message like mine is absolutely foolish. They think I'm a fool. They think I'm a fool. They think, I know, they think I do not know what I'm talking about. They didn't Elijah either. And they blamed God and they blamed this prophet for preaching this terrible thing upon their life to pray this kind of a prayer. The famine was given to wake them up to turn from their wicked ways and return their hearts to God instead of turning them away. He wanted them to learn that the famine was good and the evil was bad. Did you hear that? But you see, when you get your head so screwed up 
in cosmos diabolicus thinking, worldly thinking, that makes no sense. The fact it doesn't make sense is you need to come out of the rain. Which is a wonderful idea. They would have loved to have been able to do that when they for them you'd have to come out of the bronze and the iron. He wanted them to learn that the famine was good and the evil was bad. They responded temporarily. No, when you don't eat for three and a half years, I guess it gets kind of tough. When the three and a half years of famine was over, God told Elijah and Elijah told Ahab that God was removing the discipline by sending the rain. 18 chapter verse 1 we read. So I immediately thought of a song. Showers of blessings. God answered Elijah's prayer because God is faithful. Isn't that the truth? 2 Timothy 2 13, even when we're not faithful. You know what he's faithful to? He's faithful to his plan. That's what he wants us to do is be faithful to his plan. Finally, God's plan does not succeed or fail because of man, whether king or prophet or citizen. It succeeds because of the faithfulness of God. When your heart's turned from God, this is foolish. When your heart turns to God, this is marvelous. This is faith. Recovery of this national crisis was because of the faithfulness of God to his sovereign plan as well as to the effective prayer, listen to me now, of not just one spiritual mature believer, but 7,000 others that Elijah didn't know existed. Because if you remember the story, Elijah thought he, he belly ached. I'm the only one that represents you. I'm the only one that cares. And God says, stop whining. I got 7,000 more like you. And he went, whoa. Now let me tell you about the 7,000. We call those the pivot. Every generation has a pivot. When you get to thinking there's no one, no one left, there's probably no other doctrinal people like us that study the Bible like we do, nothing could be farther from the truth. One of the interesting things about the Internet to see how many people around the world are really interested in the in-depth study of the Word of God that bores the rest of you. It bores the rest of you. We've lived in prosperity way too long in America to appreciate God. We think it's all about us. None of it's about us. Truth of the matter, none of it. Elijah thought he was the only voice for God against the apostasy and evil of his day. But that wasn't true. Sometimes we think that nobody knows or cares. But in truth, there are many invisible heroes of faith praying along with us. 1 Peter 19, 10, 18 is where he reveals to uh, Elijah there's a whole pivot of 7,000 whose knee has not bowed to Baal and whose heart has never left me. I know that we have all prayed for other people that we do not know as others have prayed for us that we don't know. That's what we call a pivot. This is pivot power of the invisible heroes of the faith. And they live all over the world. Even our foreign missionaries. They pray for us as we pray for them. I hear from them all the time. And... Uh, I hear from people. People write to me and they say, listen, our knee hasn't bowed and we're thankful for you. We're thankful for your church to, to support the preaching of the word of God through the internet. Invisible, the pivot is the power of the invisible heroes of faith and there are a lot of us. There are a lot of us people.
doesn't mean we shouldn't have more. You know, if you look at the numbers, 7,001 is not a large number compared to the population. But apparently God's idea is a lot different than ours, isn't it? Apparently he runs numbers a little different than we do.